Good afternoon. I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's IIEA webinar, part of the Environmental Resilience Series, which is supported by the Environmental Protection Agency. We're um, very pleased to be joined today by Ian Gulland, who's Chief Executive of Zero Waste Scotland. And uh, we're grateful to him for finding the time to speak with us. He's going to talk to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to a QA and a uh, with you, our audience. Uh, you're able to join the discussion using the Q&A function, uh, which usually you'll find towards the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. Don't, don't wait until the, until the conclusion of the presentation. And I should remind you that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Um, you also uh, should feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live, stream live streaming the afternoon's discussions. Uh, so a warm welcome to the Zoom community and also to those tuning in via YouTube. Now, to the important business. Um, Ian Gulland is Zero Waste Scotland's founding chief executive. He was the program director of the predecessor program, uh, RAP Scotland. Prior to this, um, Ian worked with initiating cycling, uh, recycling systems in the public, the private and third sectors, and led the community recycling network uh, Scotland until 2008. Um, Mr. Gulland has recently been appointed president of the Association of Cities and Regions for Resource Management, uh, known as ACR Plus, and is a member of several Scottish government programme boards, including those uh, dealing with low carbon and manufacturing act activities. He was named the most influential person in the UK waste and resource efficiency sector by Resource Magazine in 2014, um, he was conferred with a fellowship of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management in 2016. Before we hear from Ian, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Emer Cotter, uh, Director of the Office of Evidence and Assessment at the EPA, to give us some opening remarks on behalf of the EPA. Uh, Emer. Thank you very much, Owen, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the, the opportunity to say some opening re remarks for what I'm sure will be a really interesting lecture from Ian and to welcome Ian to this lecture series and, and indeed our audience. Thank you for joining us. We in the EPA are really delighted to be supporting this environmental resilience lecture series um, over the last number of years. And the core objective of it has been to bring together a broad range of stakeholders behind the message of resilience, focusing both on our individual responsibility, societal responsibility, to be good stewards for our shared environment. And that has really um, allowed us to hear from a wide range of international experts, and we will hear from Ian um, today, and learn from how they are tackling the, the key environmental challenges and issues of our time. So today we're going to hear about the really evolving and dynamic circular economy space and really about the key role that the circular economies can play in transforming sustainable production and consumption models. And we know we can do that through concerted efforts to improve our waste management by reimagining the design of our products and our processes to encourage more recycling, more reuse, more repair, and also focusing on measures to prevent consumption. So this has been a really, as I say, dynamic and evolving space in Ireland over the last number of years, and particularly since 2020. We've um, had the publication of a number of key policy documents, whole of government circular economy strategy, the primary legislation, the circular economy act. And with that then in the EPA, We've, had, uh, we've established a new national circular economy program, which now has a statutory footing. And that's really uh, allowed us in the EPA to focus our efforts even more on the circular economy and to support the transition to a circular economy um, across the wide range of our functions. So including our regulatory functions, and, and with that, I, I'm, we're really focusing on 
the end of waste and the byproduct regulations that functions that we have there. In terms of our knowledge provider role, um, we produce national waste statistics. So giving that national picture on an annual basis of the waste we generate and how we manage different waste streams. And then also in terms of our advocacy roles, partnering, funding, working with others, which is so important in, in, in all environmental challenges and in particular in the circular economy side. One area that we have been really focusing on this year is developing a, a national end of waste decision for construction materials. And that will ensure that um, those materials can be used and reused, but also and that we're doing that in a way that affords a high level of protection for the environment. But we know that there's much more to do across the whole transition to a circular economy. Our circularity rates are at 2% in Ireland, so are quite low relative to other EU member states. So really, you know, looking forward to hearing what Ian has to say, we look at the circular economy and how it can also support addressing and progressing other key environmental challenges, be it in terms of climate action, and we know so much of our emissions come from the production of products and the consumption of those products in, in, in all countries, including Ireland, and also how the circular economy space can support and, and, and help our biodiversity crisis. Again, the extraction of raw materials um, and the, the, one of the key factors in terms of impacting on the loss of habitat and species. So again, there's this interconnected piece across um, environmental challenges that are coming more to the fore um, all of the time. It's something that we're very conscious of in the EPA, um, making those interconnections, making those linkages, um, so that we can um, maximise what we do. So really, without further ado, I'd like to hand over um, to Ian and, and really looking forward to listening and learning um, from what that, to what that means. So over to you, Ian. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, Imer and uh, Owen, for the introduction, and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and speak to you today. I, I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity to share certainly uh, some insights, I guess, from our work in Scotland. So I'll give you a quick overview of who we are in terms of Zero Waste Scotland. Uh, just to make sure uh, everybody's aware of, of that, a bit about our work. But as I said, yeah, I think the key thing is just to share some of the insights from that work. Uh, but also, I am keen to get to the kind of conversation bit of the, the, the webinar and get some questions. Uh, I'm always keen to make sure that what I say is relevant to the people who are listening. So the best way to do that usually is through answering questions. But I'm also keen to learn from others. And you've referenced your own uh you know, Irish strategy and and uh, circular economy act. Uh, I'm also you know very keen to you know learn from others. You know, in terms of the journey you're on and and how that's how that's working. I guess the the you know how it's bedding in and you know what you're learning already from it. So maybe there's a there's an opportunity for for you to share some of that. Uh, but also there is. Yeah, as ever, our journey of the circular economy has been, there's been a huge international dimension to it in terms of discussion and learning from others, and I'll, I'll make a bit of reference to that later on as well, uh, but the, the, the need the need to continue that, uh, you know, at a very, not just at a high strategic level, but a very operational level as well to try and learn and understand just how the circular economy has been taken forward. But I'll start with just a little bit about Zero Waste Scotland. So we are Scotland's circular economy experts. We have uh, we are fully funded by the Scottish Government to lead on a number of aspects of uh, the transition to a circular economy. We, we do support the government itself in terms of policy, uh, policy support. We, we do uh, quite a bit of research on their behalf as well. Uh, in fact, our, our research uh, several years ago really brought to prominence the circular economy, the opportunities around the circular economy and led to the first circular economy strategy for Scotland in uh, 2016, where we basically identified, certainly at a macro level, there was significant uh, climate uh, change benefits from uh, not just thinking about recycling, but thinking about the whole design of uh, material systems, but also economic benefits. In fact, that was probably the real plus for us that we demonstrated in some of our key sectors like whiskey, beer and fish, uh, as well as manufacturing, as well as the offshore, the decommissioning of the offshore, there was significant economic gains uh, by thinking more 
uh, circular, both in terms of jobs, but actually economic uh, business business opportunities, as well as supply chain uh, resilience, even then before we've obviously had things like COVID and, uh, you know, other geopolitical events since then that have really brought home, you know, the importance of having much more resilient supply chains. Uh, so that research led to the strategy in 2016, and on the back of that, ourselves uh, led uh, quite a comprehensive program uh, to support, you know, individual businesses. So we've got a business support program. We've worked with over 250 individual companies. We've invested, we've provided investment of about 14 million pounds into about 40 of those businesses uh, over the period. Uh, we've been developing uh, cities and regions programs. So again, in fact, that's probably, we've probably had the biggest penetration is working through city partners like Chambers of Commerce, not just to talk about the circular economy and raise awareness of it, but to find bespoke opportunities that were, are very pertinent to, to those specific areas, which, which are different depending on even the locations within Scotland. Uh, so we've been doing that. We've also, uh, I've been running procurement uh, training, so for public sector procurement professionals, uh, both in central government and in local government, and through some of the agencies on how do you procure in a much more circular fashion. We've been working with primarily the community sector, third uh, sector, on uh, sort of allowing them to raise their game in terms of reuse, repair, bringing a bit more of a spotlight onto that within the kind of high street, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, the experience, the, sort of the retail experience through the Revolve program. Uh, but we've also been investing in with local authorities specifically on recycling as, as well and reuse provision uh, at the very local level. We work with universities and colleges on, you know, shaping some specific courses, uh, whether that's on a practical level on through construction or through textiles, but also through business, business uh, management skills uh, in terms of circular approaches. And we also work with Strathclyde to set up the, at that time, the th I think it was the fourth uh, Institute for Remanufacturing in the world, the first in Europe. Uh, the Scottish Remanufacturing Institute at Strathclyde University. And we've also been developing, as I said, some other bespoke initiatives to the landscape in Scotland. Uh, so there's been, and, and all of that continues, we've obviously been learning on, you know, some of those programmes. We, you know, particularly the business support, we were learning firsthand how to work directly with individual businesses who were interested in being more circular. So whether that was a traditional organisation trying to shift their business model or a new startup with an innovative idea. So we've been very much much learning on the job uh, with that, but with and develop tools uh, and wider support packages for for more businesses to get involved. So I I, I think the, the thing I say when people ask me a lot about that the journey that we've been on uh, it has been a journey. We've as I said we've learned, but one of the most significant things is the shift from people seeing the circular economy as something interesting to do with waste uh, to something that's much more hardwired into our economic story or, or certainly where we would like to take our economic story in Scotland and that's not just about individual businesses thinking about their model but actually the wider economy and particularly through that cities and regions approach we've now beginning to see you know people thinking about the circular economy in terms of jobs in terms of regeneration in terms of the social aspects of that in terms of the social fabric you know community well-being uh, how the circular economy uh, principles can really really enhance uh, this situation for, for communities up and down Scotland and in the rural parts of Scotland as well, particularly, because uh, the circular economy is a very much a distributive economy. It's not it's not about dragging all of the materials into the central belt of Scotland and then trying to do something interesting with them. It is about how do we tackle the issue of, of materials uh, end of life and design the system at a much more local and regenerative level. Uh, so it's been, yeah, it's now very much front and centre of uh, a lot more people's minds than simply just the waste industry as it probably started out uh, back in 2015-16. Uh, we've also got a minister for the circular economy. I think, I think, I believe you have one as well in Ireland. Uh, we also have a bill ourselves, our own act, which is pending at this moment in time. Uh, and we've we've had a strategy, as I said, in 2016, and the plan is to revise that strategy on the back of the bill uh, in the in the months ahead. Uh, but as I think has already been highlighted that, you know, when we, we've done our own circularity gap reports, all of these things are positive, but the circularity gap report for Scotland isn't very good at all. It's less than 2% circularity. Uh, and it's one of the lowest, I think, uh, of all the kind of 
national reports that have been done uh and but so that in itself demonstrates that you know we have a lot more to do uh but actually when you look at the global picture in terms of circularity it's come down from some i think 9.5 percent to uh 8.3 percent i think it is now at a global level so it's definitely going in the wrong way but it it, it illustrates again that uh you know, even though we are enhancing all our recycling, both, you know, in Scotland and I'm sure around the world, we're not actually keeping pace with the, the consumption of materials. Uh, and that's the elephant in the room. We really do need to start addressing our uh, consumption. So we know in Scotland that 80% of our carbon footprint comes from, you know, basically the, the use of materials, the production and use and ultimately wasting of materials and products. In our economy, half of those uh, materials and products come from out with Scotland. So, uh, if we're really serious about ending our, you know, uh, our contribution to climate change, we're going to have to do something about that consumption issue, uh, and that's all of the impact that that has out with Scotland. So, I've mentioned biodiversity loss already, you know, water stress, uh, but ultimately, the, the other third crisis that we sometimes overlook is, you know, basically, tackle, how do we tackle the inequalities that we face, not just at home, uh, but around the world? Uh, and the circular economy is, is a, you know, the fact that we don't have a circular economy, the fact that we have a linear economy is definitely contributing to all of those factors, not just climate change, biodiversity loss, but actually some of the social issues that we see around the world. Uh, and these are, these are getting worse. Uh, you know, definitely in terms of climate change impacts, but also, you know, as we start to accelerate uh, the delivery of infrastructure, you know, needing to mine new materials, etc., we're beginning to see other impacts uh, around the world as well, which are, again, for many of us are out of sight, out of mind. So circular economy is certainly, you know, uh, we think the, probably the most efficient, effective tool in the box to tackling a lot of those issues uh, and thinking differently about uh certainly the leakage of materials from the system but also how can we reduce the consumption by making more of the materials that have already got in circulation using these assets in a much more productive way again and again and again uh, but that doesn't happen by accident that happens by design so whether that's the individual products being designed differently but actually designing the system and that is really really the challenge for us so this this isn't just about one business at a time uh one recycling system at a time what we really now need to start thinking about is how do we redesign our whole economic system uh and that's not just for the environmental aspects of this but again for for the wider society and you know for you know economically and socially uh and that is really the focus now of our work uh is how do we certainly we'll continue to engage with businesses and and raise awareness of circular opportunities that's which are you know win 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 in terms of uh, money and value but we really do need to start engaging with a wider system change for for a lot of the the opportunities that we see uh, and certainly there's something we can all do as individuals, you know, we, we know that, you know, in, around consumption. So, you know, textiles and clothing is obviously one of the ones that everybody talks about a lot that we all, uh, I think the average, well, the average UK wardrobe uh, is contains about £4,000 worth of garments, uh, a third of which uh, haven't been worn for over a year. So that's like over £1,000 worth of uh you know clothing that just is yeah is, is basically redundant in people's wardrobes which uh doesn't really make sense both financially and environmentally and particularly in, the, in uh current climate uh climate in terms of the uh economic situation that many of us find ourselves in so and food i'm sure we could talk about food waste uh not just uh a cost uh to us all in terms of the amount of food that we waste but again environmentally one of the biggest contributors to to the global climate crisis is is yeah is the overproduction or oversupply and ultimately over wasting of food uh, and the majority of that is actually in our homes uh, as well so there's a lot more that we need to be doing as individuals but actually collectively you know as you know, i'm sure governments around the world we need to start thinking seriously about our economic system and what drives uh what drives it and how can we you know to some extent re overhaul it uh redesign it uh and that that is it you know because ultimately we don't it doesn't happen by accident as i've said i mean i use the analogy of planting a forest you know if you could just plant seeds and the forest would arrive then that, so be it but we know that 
just planting seeds doesn't mean you're going to get you know uh, a forest or a, or a crop of whatever uh, you're planting you need to nurture it you need to think about the inputs to that for, uh, for to that crop you need to think about the growth characteristics uh, you might even have to uh, remove some of the inputs which support other types of crops uh, and you need to start thinking seriously about the inputs. so that's so that's the probably the point I would just reflect on is this circular economy is happening. Uh, you can see it not just in Scotland and I'm sure in Ireland as well in terms of the policy shift. Uh, you've seen it around the world with lots of other countries. There's a lot more uh, acceptance of it. Uh, it's really about how great a pace we want to see it being delivered. Uh, and for us, that is you know, we, we need to make some conscious decisions about the inputs to actually make, create the right environment for the circular economy to happen. And one of those, well, there's four four things that we talk about in Scotland that we really need to, to start focusing on. Uh, the first one is governance, uh, is understanding how do we govern. So it's all very well having a strategy and having a, you know, having a minister to some extent, uh, but where does that fit, yeah, particularly if we are talking about wider systemic change in terms of the economy? Does it? How does it fit? How is it being integrated into uh, the structures that oversee the wider economy? So where does the governance? It can't sit outside. This isn't a competing. The circular economy isn't a competing economy with the linear one. It has to be part of the overhaul and the re reshaping of the wider economy. So we need to start thinking about how do we shape that? So what metrics are we going to use? Uh, to demonstrate uh, performance over time, how are we going to track them, who's going to be responsible for it. Uh, ultimately, we need to see the circular economy beyond just a set of new initiatives uh, at the end of pipe. We need to see it much more embedded into the, the structural changes that we're all trying to do at a local level, at a national level, but also at an international level. And that needs that collaboration as I've hinted at before. Uh, in terms of the international dimension to, to all our work. The other thing that we do need, the second thing we talk about is infrastructure. And that's, it's an obvious thing to say, uh, but it's something that's overlooked. We, we talk a lot about individual businesses and individual companies doing well uh, in the circular economy, but we need to start creating different types of infrastructure. So obvious things are, how do you create a reuse and repair network? Uh, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of people find around the circular economy is in terms of uh, individual citizens is accessing the circular economy. So accessing re reuse and repair uh, services, for instance, both uh, urban level, but also a uh, rural level. How do we create the right systems or infrastructure to support things like reuse and repair? How do we create the right business ecosystem to support those individual companies who are starting out or innovating uh, and seeking new markets. I'm always very taken by, certainly in Scotland, uh, the, over the last couple of years, the, the development of uh, a specific business ecosystem to support uh, technology, in artificial intelligence. Obviously, again, that approach is seen as crucial to the development of our wider economy, that we all need to be much more digitally enabled, both at a company level and individual level. So how do we create the, the new tech technology companies? So there's a great creation, there's a new creation of a new ecosystem in Scotland to develop that both right from school, right through universities and tertiary education, but ultimately to create the right environment for those types of companies to, to prosper. And that's the kind of thing we need to see if we're going to be serious about the circular economy. How do we make this uh, as that type of profile, not just at uh, particularly at a local level, but also at a national level. Uh, so we've seen, you know, how do we create a design school element to to this as well? How do we start to engage more profitably with the likes of universities and colleges uh, around the challenges that the circular economy still faces? And some of them are still real. Some of them are material specific. Some of them are sector specific. But how do we get you sort of the designers and the the technical experts who are in who are in our universities and colleges and in our schools, how can we get them to apply their creativity against some of those challenges? So it's really creating, it's not just talking about it, it's creating the right ecosystem, the real business and innovation ecosystem to make that happen. The third thing, which is obviously linked to that, is about education and skills. How do we get the a circular approach, for a better word, much more mainstream? How can we get that? 
as seen as a meta skill for uh, not just our young people but everybody through whether whether it's whether in business whether in the public sector uh whether in the community sector how can we get them to start thinking much more circular in how they're doing their job because the thing about the circular economy is it's it we all have to be circular we can't have you know it, it, as we transition you know in terms of climate change all our jobs are going to change if we're going to hit our targets in scotland by 2030 2045 everybody's job is going to have to be done differently there is going to be have to be an element of more circularity whether you're in the technology field whether you're in renewables whether you're you know whether you're a dentist whether you're a teacher you know whether you're a mechanic everything is going to change so we need to we're going to have to embed circular skills in everything that we do uh and again you know we have this uh in scotland we have a, a real push for entrepreneurship uh in a lot of our colleges and universities now and even in our schools so we're teaching entrepreneurship again as a meta skill and that's not to say we want everybody to set up their own business and make lots of money it's actually seen as a skill that we need to have about individuals again whether you've got a job in public sector or community sector or otherwise, no matter what business, you need to have a, a degree of entrepreneurship. So it's seen as a meta skill that we need to have prevalent in our society. So I, I think very similar to that, we need to have that kind of circular thinking as a kind of uh, much more prevalent in our society. So people will embrace the sort of step change that we're needing, uh, we're, we're going to see uh, across uh, our supply chains and the, and the activities and the businesses world, uh, sector by sector over, over, the, over the next five to 10 years. And the fourth thing we need to really think about in terms of inputs is finance. I mean, that's an obvious thing to say, how do we fund the transition? Uh, and this is about, again, thinking differently, thinking a bit out of the box around some of the products and the way that we apply finance. So we've we've learned quite a lot, even supporting businesses uh, in terms of finance, a lot of the more traditional ways of providing money, even European funding, where you find our business and you, you fund it uh, has, hasn't allowed the, the the kind of supply chain activity that we've been trying trying to kind of uh, enhance in Scotland. So that whole sort of system change. How do you then? How do you fund the system? How do you fund multiple people in the supply chain uh, to work in concert with each other through some of the more traditional funding mechanisms? You know, because usually, oh, it doesn't work like that. You have to divide everything up, find a lead organisation. So even thinking differently about how do we fund system change is something I think we need to think about from a from both from a government point of view, but also from a business and a finance point of view. Uh, and also the fact that some of the challenges that the businesses face is about cash flow rather than investment in assets. So assets become more fluid as, as if, if you're on a rental model or a subscription model, you know, the assets are actually out in the community. So how do you create a much a different type of support role that, that to some investors find quite, quite a challenge or even quite a, a higher risk uh, in a lot of respects than some the, the more basic finance where you might be just financing a fixed asset. So it's how do you create those new opportunities in the finance world, again, both at a government level, but also at an individual investment level to see some of these uh, opportunities uh, flourish. And there is ultimately just, just probably to finish up about that international dimension, <clears throat> there is an international dimension, not just about the learning and the uh, sharing of experiences, but ultimately this is about trade, trade of products. As I said before, you know, 50% of our footprint in Scotland is, comes from overseas. Uh, so how, what is the dimension there? What is the dimension about products of, you know, you can't, I don't think any nation can be completely circular by itself in terms of resources. There's always going to be a need for resources coming in and out of countries uh, that is the mechanism of trade and the mechanism of the world that we live in but what are the, what what does that look like in terms of the new dynamics uh, so we don't all start to, <laughs> uh, to some extent create losers and winners within the trade you know because this is that's not the purpose of this but we do need to start having much more collaborative thinking around potentially trade agreements uh, trading between nations trading within you know the different uh, parts of the world and uh, I'm just trying to understand what is the impact of us becoming more circular, perhaps in the in the global north, will have uh, on aspects of the global south. So, 
these these are things that we've been starting to think about. Uh, been having wider conversations as well as all the sort of more direct support on the, on the ground for individual businesses and communities and municipalities in Scotland. But there's a wider sense now that, as I've said, it needs to it definitely needs to move on from being a kind of individual business strategy uh, to something that's much more about redesigning our economic strategy for Scotland. So I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully that's been the 15, 20 minutes and we can open up for some questions. But thank you again for the opportunity. Ian, it has indeed. Th thank you very much indeed, uh, right on time. Um, uh, and I, I think it's, uh, I mean, certainly the, the radical nature of the kind of changes you're, you're talking about, you, you haven't um, uh, understated them. Um, in my in my own uh, area, my own industry, um, I've been really interested to see that uh, recently a, an office building in Oslo has been uh, completed. Not a not a huge office building, but um, they have uh, identified that it was constructed of about eighty percent of recycled materials. A new a new office buildings, so. Um, there's a huge amount that can be done. I remember a colleague of mine, uh, not working in Ireland actually, but um, he came up with a a means of reducing waste on the, the construction site, for which he was responsible, um, by outlawing uh, waste uh, bins, wa uh, uh, skips. No skips were permitted on the site. And he said it had a huge impact because each trade then started to look differently at um, if the carpenter is cutting a piece of timber to length, he or she started to work out, well, what were the, uh, it, it produced a lot more length, uh, more waste, uh, a lot less waste if people were responsible for uh, getting, uh, disposing of their own, their own waste rather than putting it into a, a nearby skip. But um, we clearly have things in common because I think uh, uh, Emer Cotter at the beginning said that uh, our performance uh, relative to our fellow member states in the EU was very poor. I think at 2%, we were sec second worst. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a similar figure for Scotland. Um, one obvious question at the beginning is, how do you measure? What does this, the measurement of circularity mean? How do you, how do you measure circularity? Yeah, so the, the way we've measured it is... Uh... I mean, without getting too much of the technical aspects of it, is it is basically looking at data sets which are to do with the flow of materials in and out of your economy. So, uh, including the materials that are to some extent mined in your own economy. So, obviously, for Scotland, we produce a lot of materials. Uh, you know, some of that's obviously uh, predominantly uh, oil, oil or gas. Uh, and that these are materials that are flow flow through our economy. So we deduct that from the materials that we use in our economy, and also the materials that we're importing into our economy. So that's a, so a high level way of measuring, and then ultimately understanding through that kind of uh, what's it called uh, Sankey diagram, you can start working out how much of those materials are circulated, recirculated, recycled, or uh, yeah, create a circular pathway through your economy. Now. What that does show is exactly that, that we're all really at a very low level of circularity. So we're consuming lots of materials in our economy, uh, but we're not actually circulating as much as we really want. However, although those numbers that will probably be the same for Ireland, all those numbers are very low, there is a number of, there's a huge bulk of uh, materials that are actually built into our buildings. You've just mentioned that. So they are, technically, we have used them. We're a, We've absorbed them into our housing stock, into our building stock, into our infrastructure stock. So they are technically, we could be available at a later stage for circularity, but that's the trick. You see, they're not actually being circled at the moment, but we need to make sure that we do circle them because they ultimately don't become waste. But have we designed the the infrastructure, the buildings, you know, uh, in such a way that we can redeploy those materials again and again and again? So, so there is there is a, and this is an international. Uh, methodology that uh, it's a consultancy based in Amsterdam have developed uh, and it has now been used in a number of these national uh, circularity gap reports uh, but the, this is this is very much at the 
the beginning of this, you know, I, I mentioned something about the governance structure. What is the right metric? Is this the right me this, this right metric? Uh, and that's something we're very keen. We're part of a kind of wider group of other nations or certainly academics looking at this, uh, trying to decide what is the best metric, you know, what is a good metric to have so we can all not just measure what we're doing now, but more importantly, how can we measure progress? How can we set ourselves targets? You know, and that's very, something we've been talking to the Scottish government about is like, what is, you know, having a resource consumption uh, target or a resource consumption metric that we can track over time to really demonstrate. And what does that actually look like? How, you know, how practical is that? And how can you apply it? Is it done at a national, a international level? Is it done at a national level? But actually, could it be done at a local level? And you could actually see, whether that's individual councils or individual regions starting to really understand the flow of materials through the economy, but more importantly, where are the opportunities for them to minimize the, the, the carbon and, and even economic impact yeah. of those materials? It, it strikes me that there is a considerable uh, complementarity between the move in the energy sector in the building, for instance, to put much more emphasis now on embodied energy which of course drives you towards emphasizing the reuse of buildings rather than uh, uh, demolition and, and uh, new build uh, uh, and so on, because uh, embodied energy or indeed embodied carbon accounting is becoming a central thing and features in the, uh, the, uh, the draft work being done in the parliament, in the European parliament on, on um, the uh, energy performance uh, directive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you hit the nail, nail on the head. I, I mean, the people in the building world know that there's been a huge focus on operational carbon in all buildings uh, and you know, in terms of insulation and the way buildings are constructed to reduce that. And that, so the actual, but the total carbon impact of any building, you know, you know, it's half of it. I can't remember the exact statistic, but, you know, the percentage that is operational carbon has been coming down. So the biggest percentage of impact in terms of carbon is now the actual building yeah. materials and the industry is recognizing that and is now beginning to understand both in terms of measuring the impact of that, thinking about the supply of materials or the types of materials that they're using. But then, and, and that is going to drive the circular economy. So that's, that's a positive, you know, and we're, I'm sure others are very engaged in the industry because they're now not just trying to understand where the materials are coming from, they're understanding how can we design this so we we might buy them once, but we're not going to buy these materials again, and we can continually refurbish, remanufacture, or repurpose the materials. You know, and it comes back to you know like passports within buildings. You know, material passports, understanding the, what what materials are in a building and how they're in the building, so they can actually be extracted or removed, or buildings can you know take many forms over the lifetime. So that that's. That's again. That is happening. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's been led by some of the bigger, bigger companies, bigger developers, and that will then have an impact on you know the, the supply chain. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 definitely a, it's, it's it's beginning to some extent. Uh, but you know, and there'll be lots of innovation and others to come. Yeah. Um. There's a question from uh, Sean Keating, who's a retired local government director. Um, he says, while the circular economy is about much more than waste, should we allow that sector in particular to move ahead while we're working on the broader picture, given that it has such potential for early wins? Yeah, I think I I, I do think uh, there's, there is an opportunity. And I think you, know, you could argue that the waste industry or the, or the wider whether that's waste management at local level uh local government as well and even community sector organizations you know they're they're you know in many respects they're the bridge into the circle economy future you know because they've a they're, they're there and you know they're, they're moving material around they understand the material flows as well possibly not not in the more macro level but certainly uh, within the materials they're working so i think they, they do have a massive role to play and I think that again is about language and how we frame it. If we're seeing, uh, you know, sometimes get nervous about this because sometimes people talk about, oh, it's, you know, we need to end the waste industry. We need to, you know, uh, but I think it's a transition, you know, from waste through resources into that more circular dynamic uh, rather than seeing it as a com com competitor to some extent. But I definitely think of the bridge. I talk a lot about that, you know, that I think recognizing that they, they could, you know, that industry, that wider industry and expertise and knowledge that they have, a capability as well, is definitely, you know, definitely the bridge that could get us there faster. Um, uh, former government minister um, Richard Bruton asks, what have you found most useful to drive change? 
um, setting targets for waste or 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 reuse um, or using grants or uh, regulating um, and what scale of of change are you incorporating in targets I mean how quickly can we move yeah so we so we I, I, I mean simple answer to me in terms of our change has been leadership I say that uh, we've certainly had a government for a number of years now that has been really leading on the circular economy, uh, certainly in the policy direction. They've taken it, you know, obviously it's it's come out of so much of the kind of waste space, so to speak, in terms of recycling. Uh, but it's very much, much more talked about across government in terms of an economic opportunity. So that, that's where we've probably seen the biggest change because it's embraced, it's not just been around local authority recycling targets, it's not just been about waste industry, uh, you know, keeping stuff out of landfill, it's now embedded in economic opportunities in terms of jobs, sectors are now much more, uh, they're investigating, you know, the opportunities in terms of changing systems, changing materials, changing, you know, supply chains, both individually, but more, again, through that kind of cities and regions approach would beginning to see that place-based thinking about those opportunities that so it's not we've not really been target led i think that's that's interesting because you know we are because of our bill coming through uh there's obviously an opportunity there for more more regulation coming through on the back of that and potentially targets being set uh so that might you know might come back to you in a year or two's time but what's really been the change has been the leadership and we've seen that now from the top of the government into local authorities and to business as well uh and because of that it has it has brought attention to, to some extent to scotland so a lot of investors or other businesses have come to scotland who are interested in locating to scotland uh thinking of you know supporting other businesses or you know smaller businesses in their supply chain in scotland because they've seen that that that, that agenda they've seen that kind of really the profile of that agenda has been very positive uh and obviously you know one of the big aspects of our work is supporting the you know the the renewable the implementation of renewable systems you know, particularly offshore wind and you know all of those things that are happening in, in in scotland which is hugely exciting and but you know we need to make sure that they're done in a much more circular way that we're not just creating kind of waste stream for the future but also you know all of that metal whether it's steel and all of the lithium and all of the other uh, precious critical materials that are going into all that infrastructure you know will have will have an embedded carbon and ecosystem and potentially you know societal impact in other parts of the world so you know we need to build in circularity into this and use the assets that we've already got so that's yeah. and that industry recognizes that you know because they're they're up, they're up against those particular supply chain issues and thinking about resilience and thinking about you know the wider impact of that infrastructure uh, across the world because they're not just doing wind in Scotland they're doing wind in other parts of the world sure. as well so yeah. and um uh, onshore wind is already dealing with this thing of of the reblading of turbines yeah. and uh, those things are are big things to to lose yeah. if you haven't designed it for recycling you know well, it's not, it's not, there's nothing there's nothing really gets anybody's attention because you like all of these big players have now got some it, probably some shed somewhere with lots of blades in them so they're suddenly looking at it and thinking hmm, what do we do now yeah. uh so yeah and again we've been working with some companies in scotland that have you know we've got some really quite innovative solutions to that so yeah and i think that's the point like i, I was trying to make at the beginning too with the building there there are solutions yeah. if yeah, yeah. proper thought is devoted to this thing if we don't mindlessly continue the old path of the linear uh extraction yeah and i think that, 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 yeah, and that was the point I was making about, but we need to design that or a school for design or a system, an ecosystem that really does that. So we're, we're highlighting what those challenges are and we're bringing the kind of clever people, the, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, you know, whether that's academics or otherwise researchers or, or people with those technical expertise into that, you know, because it is happening. I absolutely get that. You know, I mean, we've all got great stories and, you know, I know there's lots of good, good examples in Ireland as well as Scotland, but we're really going to do this at pace with yeah. Yeah. with you know with the right structures in mind we need we need to invest in those interfaces we need to invest in the kind of clusters and the 
you know, the tech scaler hubs or whatever you want to call them equivalent to really drive this and get people onto this, get people engaged and, you know, not just the opportunities, but even some of the challenges so we can really make them make the shift. That That's what we need. That's what we were probably not seeing yet that, at that level and that scale of, of investment. Yeah. Uh, in your remarks, you, you referred to a, a, another uh, area of, of industry, another sector. And there's a question from uh, Keelan O'Sullivan, who's a researcher at the IIEA, um, and that's about uh, uh, fashion, uh, clothing, clothing. You referred to clothing. And uh, she notes how fast fashion is an incredibly harmful industry, a, a huge environmental uh, footprint, both for its production and for its disposal. Um, uh, she notes that the fashion industry is the second largest industrial polluter, accounting for 10% of global pollution, ranking higher than emissions from air travel. Um, and she wonders, would you talk about the work that you're doing on this space within Scotland, particularly in encouraging stricter legislative action? Or is, she says, is the solution in the hands of the consumer rather than the legislator? Uh, I, I mean, there is, uh, I, th I think there's quite a lot of responsibility in the consumer. Uh, and that's something that we're just about to, uh, you know, to launch a campaign uh, very soon to really raise awareness because we have uh, we do a, what we call a carbon metric assessment of household waste every year. Uh, it's a, you know, basically looking at what we all throw away uh, and understanding the true carbon impact of that, not just so much about the waste, but the actual embedded carbon in all of those materials. And what's shown this year uh, for the first time is that the clothing that we throw out, or the, the clothing that we, you know, uh, yeah, at the end of life is the biggest contributor in household waste uh although by volume it's very small it's about four percent it's it's over 30 percent in terms of carbon terms but at the same time when we went to talk to citizens about this they weren't aware of that there was a very low kind of exact number but it's a very low percentage of people actually understood there was any any carbon impact to the clothing that they're they're, they're, they're buying they're consuming uh and that's that's what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks I just don't think there's people awareness. And it's a very similar story that we did uh, during COP26 when it was in Glasgow. We did the same about food waste. Uh, people thought the biggest the biggest environmental uh, damaging material in their waste stream was plastics. Uh, but we demonstrated that actual food waste was you know, three times more impactful than plastics. Uh, and I think that's the type of story we need to tell people. People are just not aware that there is a carbon impact of everything that we buy, but particularly clothing for the reasons that Keelan has said, you know, the, the footprint, the global footprint of our textile industry uh, is hugely significant. And we need to we need to start talking about it. And, you know, I made the statistics about the stuff that we all have in our wardrobes. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we are, we consume far too much clothing uh, in terms of what we actually need and what we actually wear. And we need to start thinking about it. So there's a lot, I mean, obviously there's lots of solutions around that in terms of buying secondhand, buying things to last, sharing clothing, uh, you know, not buying fast fashion or being clear about where your fashion is coming from and what's, what is the carbon and even social impact. Uh, we're much more aware of the, the social impacts of, of fast fashion now as well, but we need to start talking about the carbon impacts of our fashion uh, and, you know, how the, how that clothing is made and what we do with it, uh, particularly after we after we've worn it. Uh, so that's so I think you know before we get into regulation, there's lots of things we could do. I'm sure about regulation, but ultimately this is about clothing. Possibly more than anything, is is the one that we could all do something differently about, you know, on a personal basis. Yeah, uh, and I think yeah, I mean you, your your emphasis on education has come across uh, loud loud and strong as well. Um, uh, would you would you for a moment? Uh, talk about maybe examples of of places where the circular economy model is is thriving is uh, where where are our exemplar where do we look to for exemplars is it scotland so yeah it, i mean one of the challenges is we all are at a starting point here i don't think there's a place you can go to and say that's what it looks like yeah because it is i don't think we're i don't think anybody any country or regions actually embrace that whole economic system change there's good examples of businesses that are doing 
good circularity. There's, there's, you know, there's good approaches in terms of legislation. There's, uh, you know, in terms of restrictions. Obviously, France have been doing quite a lot in terms of secondhand clothing and, and other products. Uh, I mean, Amsterdam. Well, sorry, Netherlands has always held up as the the leader. And, and if you go back to the circularity gap numbers, the circularity metrics, they they're the best. They're the best performer. I think they're up about twenty percent. Uh, so they're the kind of global leader, or certainly seen as the global leader. Uh, but then, when you look, you know, when you go and look at what's happening in, you know, you know parts parts of the, the, the southern hemisphere, you know, particularly in, in Africa and stuff like that, there's, you would argue that a lot of what they're doing is the circular economy. So there, although there are significant waste issues in those uh, countries, and I, I accept that, you know, and there's, there's obviously a lot of programs to support, you know, particularly around plastics and stuff like that, but. The, the reutilization of equipment and repair and you know you know even organic treatment you know much more awareness of the use of organics and stuff like that in a, in a much more circular way particularly at a local level I mean so that it's, it's it's quite interesting you know when people say that you know people always want to say is our country in Europe we should all go and visit it but actually you know sometimes I say well actually there's probably parts of Africa mm -hmm. uh, that we should all go and visit because you know there's a much more for, for obvious reasons there's a much more focus on the retention of resources or value of resources and products within theirs and that's and I think we can learn from that you know obviously having this conversation this morning uh with somebody from Wasted you know just really understanding that you know we shouldn't just think about the circular economy as some sort of formalization of of recycling infrastructure at scale and then just kind of right over the top of what's actually happening in some of these other nations around the world and that's you know and, and they need support and, and investment as well but there's something that we can all learn here uh and again that comes back to that international dimension this isn't just about you know with respect to ourselves ireland and scotland sharing it we need to start thinking seriously about what's the impact or what's the opportunities from learning from from others around the world yeah well that leads uh, naturally on uh, you you did emphasize the education and skills uh, what kind of skills are 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 needed to to move this move, to move this forward and also what kind of jobs um are likely to be created as as we move uh, as we make this transition towards a, a circular economy so we have yes yeah, so we've read a number of reports about not just the numbers of jobs but the types of jobs i mean they're they're quite they're different from different sectors uh i mean obviously if we start to get into the remanufacturing repair those are the types of jobs rather than building something from scratch but that that skill itself is not that different you know from building a product as opposed to repairing a product or re refurbishing a product so the skills are quite interchangeable uh but again we would see quite a lot of those types of jobs so service service jobs people servicing equipment or products at a local level so again that's quite a distributive economy rather than having to ship all your materials or your products back to some other part of the world for them to be repaired and shipped back again uh but there's other more I mean, I think what the point I was making about the circular economy, I think it's more of a kind of meta skill about embracing the more circular system thinking and how do we get people to embrace, you know, different technologies or different approaches to product use or, or you know, product manufacture. Uh, certainly, we definitely need some more people involved in the measurement, the metrics. So there's a lot of you know, people understanding to go into business, whether that's uh, consultants or environmental consultants, there's lots of people scoping out how, uh, sorry, measuring, you know, scope one and scope two emissions, but it's very limited uh, ability, I think, to to really get into businesses and start talking about scope three emissions and actually how do you measure that, how do you map all of that in terms of your supply chain, both up and down. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, we would argue that that's, that's something we really need now because once you get into that conversation you start to identify the carbon uh, in terms of scope three you then start to identify uh, strategies to, to, to reduce that which are usually more circular you know they might be material substitution but a lot of the, the strategies you will end up doing will be more circular and you will be investing in conversations and dialogue with your supply chains which will not just benefit you but it start to benefit wider supply chains so that's a skill that's really immediate now how do we get in and having those conversations with individual businesses both both big and large sorry big small and large about scope three emissions uh, and yeah so there's, there's some real skills that are needed now but going forward I think it's more about kind of mindset that we need we need to 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 get embedded into our wider society. 
Um, there's uh, maybe a complementary uh, perspective, and uh, that's a, a question that someone else uh, constructed. It's, um, is it possible for us to uh, arrange for those who contribute most to the race, waste creation to be part of the solution in a circular economy? Um, you know, is, is there a way that policymakers can work with uh, such corporations in, in a meaningful way? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think what the intention is behind that. It's, so, yeah, yes. I, I mean, I, I genuinely think businesses, I mean, I know there's, there's always the stuff, the media angle for some of this, but I generally think all the businesses we work with, you know, the ones that invite us in and the ones that we invite ourselves into are genuinely on this journey. They're trying to understand how they can reduce not just their waste, but think think through the supply, think through the products. There, there is pressure coming. You know, some of that is citizen-led, you know, in terms of some of it's regu obviously regulation or just things that are coming down the down the down the pipe. But a lot of it is, you know, consumer-led, consumers asking questions about the transparency of of materials that have been used or, you know, what's happening to to the product after after life. Uh, but also supply chain, obviously, you know, Scotland, you know, predominant, our economy is predominantly, you know, SMEs who are probably part of much more larger supply chains. So there is a bit more pressure coming down from the bigger suppliers who are asking those types of questions. So there is there is genuine dialogue. Again, I think it's, I think what's holding a lot of people back is, you know, I hate to say it, the skills available to actually to measure it, to to monitor it, and then ultimately to make the, you know, to to, to take forward the initiatives. You know, and and a bit of capacity, obviously. I mean, there's lots of other things going on over the last couple of years for businesses. You know, whether you're a large business or a small business, you know, in terms of the pandemic and you know, obviously again the geopolitics. So there's lots of things, you know. But at the same time, there's there is genuine. I think there's a, there's a real a, you know real appetite out there still for this, uh, but it's how do we match that demand, so to speak? But I also think government always has a role to, to facilitate these conversations, you know, is to provide. And again, it comes back to my thing about ecosystem. If you the government government's role for me is to create the right ecosystem to write to create the right support infrastructure, accessibility of the of the knowledge or information. And, and you know, I guess that's what we do. We provide that interface on behalf of the Scottish government with businesses and in the space. And we work alongside a lot of the other business support agencies to provide this the this the kind of more circular dynamic to that uh, awareness and support. So it's how do you create that that infrastructure, as I said, to actually make it happen. That's that's what we need the government should really focus on, not not perhaps the individual conversations. It's like create the right infrastructure for businesses to access the information and the knowledge that they need to make the decisions. That's yeah. you know, and ultimately the funding, whether that's public funding or private funding, is to create that right interface there as well. Because that's another thing we get asked a lot about, you know, from investors. How do we how can we get into those type of the right conversations at the right time with individual businesses or supply chains to really see how their investment could be shaped? Mm. So it's that interface that's required. Yeah. Um, you know, in Ireland, we we do have, uh, as I think you noted, uh, we do have a Minister for the Circular Economy, um, Oshin Smith, uh, TD. Uh, we now, as uh, um, uh, as um, Emer noted, I think it was, um, uh, from 2021 we have the national circular economy strategy um i i i gathered uh, i i think that dublin has been selected as the host city for the 2023 circular economy hotspot yes. and uh, i wonder what kind of recommendations i mean we're we're drawing to a conclusion now but um are there recommendations you'd have for the citizens of ireland to contribute to uh, meaningfully to because I, I I think you know you talked about structures you talked about a, a lot of things are there okay there's gaps and skills but a lot of it comes down at the end to the, to the consumer and to what he or she will will do with the thing yes so, so briefly yeah so I am actually looking forward to coming to Dublin I am coming I have been invited uh, later this year so I'm looking forward to that we had a similar hotspot 
a couple of years ago uh, pre-COVID in Glasgow uh, and they're really successful and they you know, create a lot of uh, excitement uh, and dialogue and discussion. So absolutely, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I probably didn't labour that point too much, but you know, the thing about the circular economy for me is a people thing. Uh, I think all of the businesses we work with, it's, it's about interconnectivity through supply chains across sectors. It is about how people operate and connect with each other and engage. Uh, and that goes right into the community. And that's been a huge aspect, I think, of our work in Scotland, that it's not just about businesses. We're working with communities, uh, partners on the ground and at national level. Uh, we support, as I said, a number of third sector organisations, uh, local level and reuse and repair and other types of opportunities, you know, sharing libraries, tool libraries. All of those things are as much part of the circular economy as the kind of big you know, system thinking around material flows and, you know, even some of that offshore wind stuff. Uh, it is about an integration of all of that. And that's, I keep saying that the, the thing about the circular economy is a distributive economy. It's not a, you know, big thing in the middle of Scotland. It is about how do we distribute, how do we use assets and resources in a much more distributive way uh, for value at a local level? That's, that's the essence of it. It's a regenerative economy as well. Uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. So sometimes, you know, a lot of the, the language, a lot of the rhetoric is all about the big scale, all of this. It's, you know, it's, you know, an economy. And, I, you know, I, I use that myself sometimes, but we should not, you know, lose the fact that it is actually about people, individuals, people working with it. So engaging with people about it. So circular economy might not be the language you use in the pub. I get that, you know, but reuse, repair, re, you know, repurposing, you know, social value, all of those things are, are, are at the heart certainly of our work in Scotland. And I think, again, you know, particularly the, the cities and regions, what we've done, that's where chief execs, they're looking beyond their bins and their boxes and thinking, yeah, this is something I can really build into the kind of social well-being of our, of the wider communities. And, and that's, that's definitely getting traction there. Thank you very much indeed, Ian Gulland. I think that's a very good note to, to end on. I mean, we've we've recognised the radical nature of what we're what we're talking about in 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 structural terms, uh, really far-reaching uh, questions, redesigning economies and so on. But um, two older heads like myself, these ideas aren't so foreign. I mean, we were reared in a way where waste was wrong, waste was bad, and um, you know. And so let's let's rediscover some of these things. Let's learn from people who are still doing this in some parts of the world now and let's maybe abandon some of the bad habits that we acquired yeah. during an age of consumerism and so on yeah. Ian, take, thank I'll you very much that. indeed for being with us today oh. bye bye thank you thank you thank you very much everyone thank you <laughs>